Right, OK, so I thought I'd go next just simply on the basis of the comments you were just making, Mark, <laughs> about this. As, as the title suggests, this may relate to what you were just saying. So um, uh, let me just introduce uh, ourselves so you know who we are. Um, let me, right. So, um, so uh, Perspective, um, spin-out company from UCL, founded about five, six years ago. Um, we're working with operators and authorities on network planning, scheduling, and real-time operations. Um, and really what I wanted to just raise was more kind of questions ultimately, I guess, about the protocols within a UTMC as to whether it should provide priority and, and what those rules should be and what, what we should be trying to optimise for um, when giving um, signal priority or, or any other form of priority. So we're, we're working across the country in a load of different cities, working with a number of the operators um, that are kind of trialling these things. Um, uh, and. Um, we've got to a point where we've been able to kind of prove um, the kind of validity of a set of methods that predict um, future positioning of vehicles and uh, future positioning of passengers through the network um, and using that capability to provide better instructions either uh, from a planning perspective when, when putting schedules and timetables together or from a real-time control room operations perspective. And so for our, our interest is really about how those systems might interact more intensively with, with, with the UTMC um, uh, systems that, that have to consider other things. So, as I said, we have um, kind of this range of products that kind of work from kind of the most planning, kind of strategic oriented places where we're trying to use data to forecast demand and forecast uh, uh, travel times in order to make the actual design of the services more effective, all the way through to kind of real, real time information. Um, and it's on the, on the kind of the real time side that I wanted to touch upon today because it relates to what we were just saying. Um, so we've got this product called Flurist Live, um, and what it's doing is trying to make control room operations move from, from a more reactive way of working to a more predictive way of working. And what we mean by that is, is rather than waiting to see issues emerge on the network and then try to intervene by truncating trips, casting trips, turning trips around, those kinds of interventions, <laughs> trying to forecast those things emerging before they have done so you can send subtler interventions and actually um, not have the same effect in terms of lost mileage of, of, uh, of, of the effect of an intervention that's needed to come maintain effective servicing, effective headway. So like, control room operations are generally reactive. Right? They, they, you, you know, th it, controllers are intervening on the basis of a set of priorities based on current status uh, where they're trying to make the best decisions about which services to intervene on at any given time. Um, and really, like, the systems that are around them are telling them what the real-time status is so that they can make a reaction to what they're seeing. Um, but I think that we're moving to a position where it's possible to be more proactive by having foresight as to what will be coming. Um, and so we've been trialling systems that, that are uh, intended to do exactly this, where you know, the emphasis is on regulating a service um, with knowledge of what will come downstream. Uh, just before I move on, I think it's relevant here. Look, one, one of the things that, that, that really is um, perhaps a disconnect between like, the, the standard signal priority systems and what's actually happening in, in an operator's control room most of the time is that an operator is trying to optimise for uh, customer experience from the point of view of waiting time at the stop as much as actual transit time. <coughs> Um, and, and we know from a number of studies that you know, the customer's perceived cost of waiting time is higher than the perceived cost of transit time. So for them, actually, how long someone's waiting at a bus stop may be as or more important than how long it's taking to actually progress downstream on the bus. So thinking about headway, excess waiting time um, does suggest you know, we should start thinking about how that might feed into to the way in which we're prioritising buses. So if you think of this in, from the point of view of you know, what, what is a controller trying to regulate for? What are they trying to see happen? Um, if you think of these arrows as buses and the colour coding being green ahead of schedule, yellow being generally where it should be in terms of its positioning to the vehicle in front and behind, and red being behind where it should be, then really what everyone is trying to get to is yellow all the time. They're not saying, well, how can I get this bus faster? It's like, how can I get the headway faster? So every, you know, in, in London, any, any operator running against the, the Quix framework is constantly thinking about you know, how do they use the systems they have, like iBus, to regulate services as they're moving down, downstream. Now, um, uh, what effectively we've developed is a system that's looking to forecast where the buses will be under a condition where you do nothing, 
So where will those buses be in one minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes time? Um, based on an archive of historical data and the understanding of the current status. And then also evaluating, well, what would happen if you make intervention A, B, C, D? And then testing many, many different interventions to find what the most appropriate thing to do is to improve service regulation. In real time, yeah. So, so this is then this is then provided as a as a prop, as a decision tool for controllers, so they can be uh, more accurate in their prioritization of, of interventions. And most of the time, what they're trying to do, as I said, is manage headway as opposed to um, uh, speed up the bus per se. Managing headway in itself uh, tends to lead to shorter transit times. Um, and the system is also able to then provide forecasts of downstream vehicle departure time and downstream vehicle occupancy, as opposed to just understand the actual current current time. So that predictive capability, I think, raises interesting questions about um, what might be done to update the way in which we provide priority signaling. As I was saying, because there's this difference in, in, in the perception of the cost of time, um, it may make, in some circumstances, not in all circumstances, some circumstances, not to give priority in order to maintain headway. So let me give you a very, very simple example with the worst graphics you'll see today. Um, so essentially, if you take that same logic as before, you know, green is ahead of where it should be, yellow is roughly where it should be, and red is behind where it should be. And then you've got two traffic signal options. If you're saying that there's one service in front that's broadly where it should be, and it's given a, a red signal, um, and the one that's behind that, that's already too far in front is given a green signal, um, then you find you've actually made the situation worse from the point of view of headway, even though you've actually given priority. So, you know, you end up a situation they're starting to cluster, you get end up with more bus bunching, and then bus bunching is a very path-dependent process. Um, if, however, you get the signalling right, then you're actually starting to alleviate a problem through the actual signalling system rather than through control room intervention, which is, is a very powerful thing because um, it's not having to lose mileage for the operator. Um, uh, so, you know, you, you put the right signals in the right place, you're starting to generate that even headway. But this does suggest that um, there will be circumstances where, you know, the evaluation of what should happen shouldn't be just on the basis of the proximity of the event or the knowledge of the location of the bus. It should be that kind of broader understanding of expected downstream location. Um, so really, this, this is just kind of raising the question as to what might be possible, really. Just a provocative question, really. Is it, is it possible to start integrating the system so the, the knowledge that's being used inside the control room to start regulating headway could be converted into, into you know, systems for actually triggering a priority event that links to what's expected downstream and vice versa. Can information be coming from the UTMC to inform expected downstream locations so these kinds of systems are more coupled? And that was it, really. I just wanted to raise that and say, you know, the, these things are kind of happening in isolation, and I think there's an opportunity for more integration in this space. I'll leave it there. So, you're making forward predictions on that vehicle location using that historical data. So is that coming from bonds, or is that something you're collecting from devices? So it depends on the context. So it's usually working directly with the operator with the devices, the hardware devices on the bus. Um, it might come from devices that are associated with you know, um, uh, kind of, um, smooth driving monitoring, um, you know, anything you can get that give you the best kind of real-time information you have. But going back to what we were saying before as to whether you need you know, second by second information all the time, again, in, thi in, in this case, kind of the recommendations can be more approximate. If you're trying to say, well, generally speaking, where will you be in five minutes time? You don't necessarily need to know, you know precisely where you'll be at all those points downstream because you're trying to regulate the service over you know, a 30-minute journey and so forth. Um, so you know, the, the, the data requirements you know, may not be as stringent as, as in other cases where you're trying to get you know, real-time position from one stop to another, where you wanted to understand positioning as you move from that stop. Yeah. I think it's interesting to remember that not dealing with buses in isolation. Yeah, actually, particularly where we've got um, in traffic bus priority, so we haven't got bus gates except for those we've got. So actually, when we give these priority, we're actually going to flush a whole load of additional other traffic through as well, potentially. And it's understanding the impact of that downstream. You know, well, we've just, we just helped the green to get the bus through, but we've had another 20 vehicles through. Yeah. And that's all going to arrive at the next junction and cause an issue down there. Um, so, I think. Mean, it's really interesting to look at that type of way of walking there, but 
but we've also got to understand that you have open attack on other vehicles go through as well. Yeah, yeah I was going to uh, uh, comment on that as well. Um, as a as a rule of thumb, when you're when you're in a, in a mover type situation, that's, that's not, not a problem because it, it's operating isolated anyway. If you're in if you're an area control situation, then um, other things being equal, and of course buses mean other things are not. Other things being equal, the fewer priority requests you get, the better, because that enables you to optimize around flow generally. The thing about priority requests is that on the whole, they're coming unexpected. Yeah? So you get a project request, you have to you have to muck up your, your nice smooth yeah. <laughs> Now you could imagine a situation where the uh, the UTC um, control algorithms are sufficiently sophisticated to allow for flow based on schedules or something like it. You could also imagine a situation where, but I don't know how that would work. Um, you could also imagine a situation where, rather than relying on historical data, you rely on dynamic congestion data to do predictions, which might be more useful. There's no point in, in saying, well, historically, we're going to get from here to there in three minutes, but we happen to know there's a you know, broken down vehicle on the way, and it's all congested, so yeah, that's pointless. Um, how, we, how additionally useful would that be? I don't know. Um, yeah. But the general point, that, that you make here, that, that avoiding bunching by giving appropriate area type decisions is a, is a good one. Yeah, I think, I think the point you're making um, is a very strong one in the context where you can potentially forecast where you will need uh, a green wave signal, you know, five, ten minutes in advance, and then you're sending that request through much earlier than you would be at that last minute, you know, when you're, when you're coming through. Yeah. Yes, point. I mean, there's a general question around that, which is how, how 
how do you operate a dynamic system in the context of incomplete or unreliable data source? Yeah. yeah. I, I just had a question for the wider group. How are we managing the, the priority current of the Arctic 31? Is that priority number field something that would change or is everything max priority? Yeah, we, we have not found out until we'll just give everything the same at the moment in the absence of anything, yeah. any other information. So that's the lever that we could pull on a trial, right, to see <coughs> do we have, you know, a, a certain high corridor network that is a higher priority level than anything else that's a regional, for example, and then see the impact of that, if that makes sense. So if everything's priority one, then we're back to the same position. I mean, that data on late line buses, on the timetabling, I think the more data you've got those things, the more you can... And I think that the underlying point is this is always going to conflict with the UTC structure. So we could be saying buses. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.